What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are now going to be talking about the purpose of startups. We have Dr. Tina Ruseva joining us on the show. Hi, Tina. Hi. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. <laughs> We're super pumped for this episode. For those that don't know Tina's background, she's the founder of Mentessa, which is a matchmaking application that allows people to find the right expert at the right time at work. She's also the author of Big Heart Ventures, which is about the purpose of startups, especially in the next age of technology. You can find the links in the bio below to mentessa.com, tinaruseva.com, also bigheartbook.com, and her LinkedIn and Instagram profiles. Tina, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your <laughs> thoughts on the direction of our world? <laughs> the direction of our world. Well, as a tech startup founder, when I'm thinking about our world, I always think about technology and about entrepreneurship. And what we can see is that um, technology is, is converging with all the other systems that we have installed with our societal system, with our economical system, with um, um, even with our biosystems. And what this does is that the efficiency of technology um, is becoming omnipresent to all other systems. Mm. We are also about for this to redefine the way we work, the way we live with each other and also individually. And this is a time that I perceive as a time of transition. And this is the reason why I I have written the book and why I'm really uh, thinking about the purpose of everything I do more because I believe that the efficiency of technology um, is changing its effect and um, it's important to gain consciousness back for this reason. <laughs> so we have this technology that is being democratized across the planet, it's enabling creativity, it's also somewhat, in a sense, we're still spiritually or ethically or emotionally in kindergarten in some yes. ways. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to be really good stewards of the planet yet. We uh, still commit acts of violence over resources or r religious discrepancies or land or res mm -hmm. all this type of stuff, discrepancies. So how do we, how do we uh, let how do we in, how do we go forth with technology being democratized and enabling all these things while we're not really still spiritually that advanced yet? Mm. Well, I don't know if um, if an if an end state like this is possible at all. What is specifically interesting about what's going on right now is that technology has always been the domain of experts and specialists. Um, of people that had a lot of boundaries to overcome to use it. Uh, think about the installation of a railway system. You have authorities to grant permissions, you have physical um, circumstances to overcome to build a railway system in a country. With information technology and the way how it democratized um, itself, um, technology became accessible for everyone, for us, for, for everyone, so also for ordinary people and the boundaries to use it became really low. So even now, for example, artificial intelligence is available as a service. Everyone can AI everything, so um, this is the reason why we need more consciousness about this. But I'm not sure if an end state where we are fully conscious spiritually or however is possible at all. Why don't you think it's possible at all? Because technological progress has always been moving society forward and improving our lives and if you look back um, and compare just 10 years backwards, 20 years backwards, 100 years backwards, we're really well off. So we live better, healthier, longer than ever before, tendency rising, exponentially rising. Um, so I think that technology is, you know, an important component, empowering humanity and part of us. 
Yeah, likewise. I see it that way as well. At the same time, I see the desperate need for us to spiritually actualize and recommune back with creation or the divine or source mm. or God. And it just seems as though human has forgotten source and mm. that we're off playing with godlike technologies while we're spiritually in kindergarten and mm. previous civilizations have collapsed because they've been doing exactly that. Mm. And so our wisdom race that we're in to raise consciousness fast enough to be able to deal with mm. the democratized technologies, I think is one of the most important things that we're currently experiencing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, go ahead. And maybe it's not something that's lost uh, because we have in our bodies, we have the ability to sense um, the right things, the wrong things. So we have actually the, uh, biologically, we are all set to do this. And um, I personally believe, I'm a huge fan of technology. I personally believe that it is revealing us to have more time to find more ways to connect to ourselves. For example, um, a, just a beautiful photography of nature is found to um, reinforce the same chemical reactions in the body as if we would be out there seeing it. And f experiencing this feeling of awe is found to make us better for a certain period of time. So having the technology to make a lot of beautiful pictures automatically makes us better and more connected and uh, yeah. Yeah, there's lots of aspects of technology that as they become democratized, they can help us become more spiritually connected and aware. So that's definitely something that will help. Tino, who were you growing up? You grew up in Bulgaria. Yes. What was that like growing up there? <laughs> and, you know, who were you? How did you get interested in what you care about yeah. today? Well, I grew up in the 80s in Bulgaria and I love saying that I was born at the same time as the internet but <laughs> in Eastern Europe yeah. and it was a time of a transition from communism to democracy and a time of constant change. Um, it was actually similar, similar to what we experience now in Western Europe with digital transformation and transformation of society and you know gaining back consciousness because Every transition is connected with a lot of insecurity in people and also um, with a lot of opportunity. So I, I, I sometimes I feel that I'm back in the past today. And Bulgaria in, um, in this time was a really interesting place to live because um, uh, it was a place of yeah constant change. So on the one day we... Um, Everyone was forbidden to go to church. On the next day, everyone was allowed and had to go to church even. On the one day, we had to wear a uniform to school. On just literally on the next day, no uniforms were needed. So it was like constant change. And I think that this is one of the reasons why I grew up with this sense of purpose. Because, you know, when everything around you is constantly changing, you either give up because there is nothing you can do about it, right? or you develop something on the inside that you can hold yourself to so that there is this mm. one, at mm -hmm. least one sustainable thing in your life. Mm. So you found yourself early finding some sort of a deeper meaning or purpose and then going forth with yeah. that. I don't, mm, I don't know purpose, but for me it is more like this integrity. So, okay, everyone is constantly changing. I have to take care of who I am myself. Mm -hmm. It was the lack of orientation um, according to, to the external environment. And then when did you end up deciding that you wanted to do innovation management, figuring all of this out? Yeah, well, I, I studied computer science. I came after high school, I went to Germany <laughs> and I studied computer science and journalism. Then I joined um, a large tech company and I realized that the way I had studied did not, show, did not prepare me to understand what the technology that we were producing in the company was used for. And I wanted to, to know this um, and went back to, to do an MBA 
and from the from the MBA I started the company and the company led me to to the innovation management so it's it was really a messy process finding this <laughs> yeah what was the deal when you were <laughs> when you were growing up what was the deal with the indecision with the um, with like the school or the governance with the different rules or like why was it one day like this the next day like that well because because of the transition communism to democracy at in one day of the year end of my life um, suddenly going to church became allowed when the communist regime failed and um, it was a single day transition yes but also the people yes so every it's difficult for me to talk about this in um, in a foreign language because I have never done so but um, when you have there is in ethics there is this term of natural law so when you have a natural law for example forbidding people to believe this is a natural law that cannot uh, be sustained so there that you have different types of coping mechanisms with it some people become cynical some people cope on the outside at least and some people just play games and as a ch child you are uh, children are very sensitive against all this, so you are percepting all that. So it's period of constant change means that in the one day you talk with a person that tells you that everything that's going on has a reason, on the other day you speak with somebody that is cynical about it. Mm -hmm. So you don't have external orientation. It's a difficult subject, I believe. Yeah, well, especially if that if it's one day is like everything has a reason and it's meaningful and the other day it's like nihilism yeah yeah but um you know we don't need to to get very political but um it's also the same in some media today too and um this is um frightening young people or not frightening them but just pushing them back from consuming um media this okay the one day and the other day are not connected. There is no common purpose combining the, the effort of, of politics or initiatives or whatever. There is just this, okay, whatever makes me successful. Yeah, this subject is one that is, there's times of transitions that have happened around the world for different cultures transitioning maybe towards a more one could say uh, a more spiritually conducive or a more uh, a conducive social fabric to unleashing people's gifts mm. and so that's ideally where I want to see things move in the direction that it enables people to bring their gifts completely forth and not in a way that you know that squelches people's gifts and doesn't give them the ability to shine mm. And whatever that fabric looks like, I don't think it looks like what we see with echo chambers and tribalism and cognitive ease and the destructive uh, tendencies of war and fighting over resources. It's, we're so spiritually in kindergarten. It's so hard to... It's, I'm grateful that at least some uh, <laughs> places have transitioned to what seems to be more conducive. Mm. Yeah. I have an interesting thought about this, just yes, spontaneously. Share. Yes. Mm. Have you thought about how birds fly in a common direction? So mm -hmm. they don't talk to each other, they just know where to fly. Kind of like swarm mentality. Yes, and then there is this evolution of all animals that learn from all previous species before them a certain behavior and I, I have happened wondering why is this not so with people because we are born and then every single baby grows up to to learn in their own speed without inducing the behavioral evolution of all the other humans before that and I just think that it might be that um, the human life is just too short for this to happen because you say we're spiritually 
um, very early on and in the kindergarten, maybe we just don't have enough time to reach the critical mass for this inflection point. And this is uh, the interesting thought I, will, I wanted to share is maybe this is something that technology is going to help us with because we are increasing longevity and life expectation uh, with technology. So maybe it will become possible through that to live long enough to go to the next step so that uh, we also evolve. Fair. <laughs> Fair, yeah. Everything's possible, so I'm extremely open to, to that. And it also is uh, a big, most pressing issue of our time to figure out how to globally uh, collaborate on the future trajectory of the entire species. Mm. So hopefully we can do it, everyone. <laughs> hopefully we can do it. I, uh, I have faith in us. Now, wh how did you go from um, doing your PhD into Big Heart Ventures into doing your authorship? Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it was very easy. So um, right after my MBA, I started my company because I had um, turned a mother. And for the first time in my life, I had a, a problem. Uh, I couldn't go to the gym. And uh, it was 2009 and rapid internet had arrived to Europe. And I just had this idea, oh, if I can't go, maybe it can come to me, like a little bit like the Mohammed in the mountain. And I um, came up with the idea of the first online gym. Um, I had the company for four years. It was successful. And um, I became mother for the second time. And it started to, to get really difficult to be, to be in both roles. And um, hear about consciousness. There are a lot of people that think they, they have to do this and then they have to do that. And I am also always, or I have always asked myself the question, why do you do the things that you do? And um, being in front of this dilemma, um, I did something um, quite, I believe, um, uh, I took a quite a unique decision. I decided to step back from a successful company to take care of my kids because I knew I am the only one that can do this job and I knew that everything else can wait. So stepping back from an interesting, very fulfilling life as a startup founder, I found myself having a lot of energy. So I didn't want to travel a lot, but I still wanted to work and do. And um, this is how I came to to, to decide, uh, I decided to do the PhD in innovation management. Mm. From then on, I started teaching. I started working in big companies on startup programs, um, creating acceleration programs, creating um, ways for young st startup companies to cooperate with big departments of uh, corporations. And um, yet it has never been as fulfilling at, as the startup was. So I was asking myself the question, okay, what am I doing? Am I the right person to do this? Aren't they uh, hundreds of thousands of others, innovation managers that can do this job? What, what is my um, unique, um, you know, um, qualification to do this? And I couldn't answer this question for myself. Um, because my unique qualification was somewhere else and it was definitely as a, as a founder in the, in the creative problem-solving space. And um, one day it was somewhere in between the one startup and the other, somewhere in between of those five years working in innovation management. Um, I had this idea of big heart ventures. I didn't know what it is, but I just, I just stopped and contemplated this expression for several years. And with time, it started to occur to me what, what it is. And I started playing around with, I, I registered the trademark, big card. I um, did a lot of tests. So you can find all sorts of flyers. I gave workshops on big card entrepreneurship. I, I really just, as a child, finds a toy and plays with it. I just played with what occurred to me. And at one point it was very clear what it is, that it is a book and that it's the Big Heart Ventures book. And from the book um, at the reading events, people were coming to me and saying, okay, I want to do it. 
I also want to have purpose in my life and in my startup and how do I do it? Uh, how do I find other co-founders that think like this? And this is when I decided to start also as a side project, the Big Heart Collective as a community for those people to gather and to expand its, uh, their, uh, their own, yeah, each other's potential. So this is a very organic process. I'm sorry if I disappoint you, but there was no strategy like saying, first I'm gonna do this, then I'm gonna do that, then I'm gonna do this. For me, life is more of a playground and as soon as you're conscious about what is happening, you can learn really a lot and you can surprise yourself about the opportunities. Why big heart? Well, um, Big, big for me is the big reason you're doing something, the purpose. And for me, purpose is never just an ambition, just a goal, what you want to have. Everybody wants to have something. For me, big is how the things that you want to achieve contribute to a better world. So it's a very mindful, very conscious approach to goal setting and, um, you know, a journey. Um, heart, I... Um, I realized, do you know where the word courage comes from? It comes from the Latin for cur, for cur, for heart. Oh. So courage comes from the heart. Oh, cool. And yeah. I realized because I have often, very often in my life, I, I have been claimed to be fearless. Even Randy Commissar from Klein and Perkins once said that I'm fearless. I was, who I was so humbled, especially because it came in a period where I was really afraid, a lot afraid on, on the inside. But then connecting it, where does this fearlessness come from? And I think it comes from a sense of integrity that I know what is important for me and I know how to, how to listen to, to my intuition. And so this is what Big Heart stands for, because the purpose in heart is the, the values. And I believe that if you're conscious about both of them, so where you're going and what are you willing to spend for this, what are you not, and what are your boundaries of good and bad, then you can go really far in a venture being courageous and fearless. So that's the, mm -hmm. eventual, um, the eventual explanation of s what occurred to me just um, five years ago without any meaning. Yeah, okay. so coming forth from our heart is maybe our like destiny or our, our divine purpose on this planet, our gifts. And so they're in our soul or our spirit or our essence. And then to be able to kind of like dust off that and bring it forth into the world, it's a, it's a tough process. There's yeah. a lot of, of clearing of this channel of integrating of trauma, of healing that has to happen in order mm -hmm. for us to come forth with mm -hmm. it. So then, what was Big Heart Ventures when you're doing these readings, when, you, when you're synthesizing, putting together the book, what, were, what are these key points that you're sharing with people? Um, well, uh, all key points are connected with technology, entrepreneurship, and purpose. And the one key point is that technology has become so efficient that it is changing its effect. Uh, you can see this, for example, in a social network. There have always been um, people with, um, that had the broader interest of the, of the mass, like the royals, the politicians, the movie stars. Um, but suddenly there was a social network and democratizing connection, the ability to reach everybody on this planet. And uh, this efficiency transformed the technology that was built to literally connect friends on campus to a technology to build audience for a business. So the efficiency of technology changed its effect. And there are also many other examples. Um, around the financial crisis, there was this, um, um, a lot of um, conversations about automated trading systems. Before software emerged, and this is why technology is so really um, important for the conversation, before software emerged, the job of an investment broker at the stock exchange was to evaluate companies, businesses, based on their KPIs, but of course also based on their purpose, on their long-term vision, on what they would contribute to society and so on. Um, when algorithms emerged, 
um, the investment broker was replaced by software that was looking for split second opportunities sometimes that were entirely optimized for short term gains. So this entire purpose thing just uh, fell behind and um, this whole thing had the name of the shareholder value paradigm, um, has gained a lot of criticism um, during and after the financial crisis but it's still the, predominantly the predominant way how companies and businesses are run. So first key point is the, the efficiency of technology changed its effect. Second key point is technology has become so efficient that efficiency is a given so it's not something we should care about. Um, your LinkedIn profile right now is an example of automatic of, of efficiency so without you being involved it is out there communicating your mission vision um, um, selling the, the 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 stuff that we sell and so on the second point is so the th the third point is that um, given that efficiency is a given and in the face of so many challenges like the global warming seventh year in a row the economist is reporting highest forced migration rates in a row. Uh, we have rising um, knowledge gaps, skill gaps, um, social gaps. Um, in the face of all that and running out of time, um, when efficiency is a given and when technology has empowered us to achieve so much and sometimes really so easily, why would you start a company that does no good? So there is this um, next point um, that this all leads to a necessity to leave the dichotomy thinking between for-profit and non-profit businesses behind. Mm. Because if you can have all efficiency and if you have so much to solve, every business should be profitable and social. So those are maybe the, the, the main points around technology and entrepreneurship and then um, it's not a how-to book, so you cannot read it and know how to do everything, how to build a company, how to do on purpose. But I speak a lot about courage and I have like a chapter that's called The Seven Benefits of Purpose. Mm -hmm. So maybe the, the next last key takeaway from the book is that being conscious about all that and about yourself will really help you go further down the line of achieving your goals and um, being also fearless, what is oftentimes the single one difference between people that do and don't. Yeah, that's <laughs> profound. I agree with you completely. So what do we do then when there's this, this beautiful gift that's cooking within all of us that is like our unique purpose that we want to bring forth and we have to be courageous and fearless with bringing it forth mm. how do we maximize more humans being able to unleash that mm. well good question so i tried maximizing this with one-on-one -on -one. i um, did a coaching training with the CTI, it's a Californian coaching institute, the biggest in the world. And I started like helping people on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And I realized that this is too slow, too, you know, ineffectful. Then I thought mm, I should write a book because it's like one to N and then you can mm -hmm. maybe reach other people that need this and don't have a coach. And um, the next step in this thinking process was end to end so everyone can help somebody everybody has strengths everyone can can be of use especially in society that is evolving towards not working for money super interesting uh, evolution and my answer but with this towards purpose yes and uh, absolutely and my my very first um, um, stone laying the underground for this is mentessa Mm -hmm. because it's a peer-to-peer -peer matchmaking application that helps people help each other. And this is like how, how I try to help, how I see this. And the second thing is um, just a very direct advice. When I, my, my book readings typically start with, okay, who here wants to have an impact? And we are all suckers for impact and all the hands go up. 
And then if you look at the stories of people that really had the impact, um, it was not an overnight success, it was not um, an easy game, it was not luck. It was typically giving away a lot of power, freedom, benefits, um, luxury, resources for the, for the cause of something for quite some time. People want to have kids, but then they say, oh, but it's probably difficult to have kids. Well, if you want to have an impact, you have to invest something for this. And yeah. uh, my piece of advice is, if you want to have an impact, you have to find something to fight for that makes you forget about the, the invest that feels like um, the suffering that we go through in order to achieve yes it. that feels like uh, a gift to fight for yes yes so for me for those that maybe have yet to identify with something that is of a higher calling for themselves how do you, we go about helping people identify their callings? Does Mentessa pairing people, mm -hmm. does that sort of help people find their callings more effectively or what mm. can really catalyze that? Yeah. Well, uh, for this, I have developed the heart framework. <laughs> Tell it's, us about it's it. It's described in the book. So uh, it's a step-by-step -step process because so many people love processes. I'm not the process person, but uh, it works and it's just an acronym for a very well-known method from coaching and from uh, personal development. So H stands for have. Have all of your values. Just write down what you think is important to you. Spirituality, um, uh, for some people it's um, luxury, for some people it's um, power, uh, building stuff, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, have as much as you can think of written down. This is the H. And then there of is... Of your values. Of your values. And values it can be everything. Because um, among us, words are just labels for things that are different in all of, the, all of the different heads. So write everything that comes up to your mind. It might be a, a sentence. It might be um, a verb. It might be just a, a classic value. There are also value lists on the internet where you can download O200 classified values and write as many down as you think that refer to you. Mm -hmm. And then typically around this process people have several and then comes the E, so elect. Mm -hmm. And this is where it gets really interesting because yes, we, I have a high value on sustainability, I have a va high value on um, Productivity, I have a f high value on recognition, so how do I combine those three? You have to elect what comes before something else. Mm -hmm. and the uh, order, so you rank the values. Yes, because they trump each other. Mm -hmm. And um, you might have a great value on sustainability, but if you're not prepared to repair your cell phone five times before you throw it away, you won't be living up to this value, or maybe it's mm -hmm. not so important to you as yeah. being cutting edge in technology, which yeah. is also fine. Yeah. And then there is um, making conscious what is unconsciously in us, because we all have values, we just don't know what they are. And knowing them helps us take decisions more quickly. So the, um, this is where the A comes into play. So this analyze, just take every word on this piece of paper that you elected, like your shortlist, and think about what does this mean to me? What does sustainability mean, mean to me? Is this like saving the planet by building a startup? Or is it um, properly dividing the garbage? Is it being a good mom? Is it whatever? So just analyze what those words stand for, because this is one of the things I believe are the major calls about losing track of our consciousness or just of, of each other in the society. We rely too much on words that are labels and that are not the same for everybody. Yeah. And then it gets really easy. So the R is for repeat, uh, for, uh, yeah, for repeat. So you do this process until you have really little values. Mm. We know that the human brain can only memorize three to maximum seven values. And if you want to be quickly taking the decisions that are really truly rightful for you, you have to limit the list so that you can memorize it, so that you're conscious. And then the last step is I 
I personally find the most effective is testing values. Mm -hmm. So you can, uh, you, you maybe you're not sure what what is your most important value. So try it on for a day. Go be one day. I don't know sustainable. Every decision that you take this day, what you eat, what you buy, how you speak to people, how you advertise your product, how you create new opportunities. Do everything prioritizing sustainability and then you will see how you feel because as I said in the beginning we have the muscles to, to know if something feels good or wrong. Well, yeah, right or wrong. Hmm. Ooh, I like this heart process a lot. <laughs> yeah, I like it a lot. You know, it's really So you're good. one of the process guys? I, I love process and well, especially when, when we're talking about how to help people identify what is their most core values uh, with better way than to initially just go and start writing down our core values, ranking them, mm -hmm. and then going through the process of re repeating these tests, analyzing, mm -hmm. repeating these tests with them, all this type of stuff. And then all of a sudden you have these maybe three or seven core things that you carry around with mm -hmm. you. Whereas other times, if we're just walking around, we don't actually carry around with us those core things. And then it's like other people can program our life rather than we yeah. ourselves choosing where we want to go and what mm -hmm. we want to do and what value mm -hmm. we want to bring to the world. Mm. It's and it's crucial. all about just making it, bringing it on the surface because we all have this. It's all in an, in an order within us. So we all have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We just don't know which this is. And there is so much noise around us and so much yes. should haves, must haves, you know, the smog should must ought got to <laughs> the smoke. oh that's it i like that <laughs> so, should must ought got to yeah yeah and it's all about it's There's just lots of noise yeah just a mechanical bringing it to the surface and i also believe that you know your values can change so it's important to take from time to time the opportunity to reevaluate what is really important to you. Some people do it on Christmas, others do it every Sunday. I guess it's also a personal thing. Yeah. Oof. Okay, so there's these these are they're they're within us, these core values, and then we have to then go through a process of identifying what are those. We have to like write them down and identify them. Mm -hmm. So they're are they with us from birth? Or do they constantly yeah, get discovered mm. and changed throughout life? Maybe mm. they're different when you're 50 than when you're 20? Yeah, absolutely. Um, values have a lot to do with a lot of stuff, a lot with the prevailing culture in the country that you live in, uh, with the family that you're raised for, with the relationship that you're having, with the experiences that you're doing. Um, I don't think values are inborn and this is why it's particularly important to be conscious about them because it's something that we have somehow developed and wouldn't you want to know what you have in your luggage uh, bringing around you because every person develops something else it's something of it's a choice the values and all that so I don't think they're b built in there's just so much that plays a role and exactly for this purpose it's important to to take a closer look on that what are your core values it's great that you ask when i gave the tedx talk in San Francisco last year in November or in October, I delivered um, the questions that I thought were most thought provoking for people to ask themselves and others. And one mm. of those questions was, what are your core values? Oh, so it's great that <laughs> that uh, that you're bringing it back <laughs> up right now. But it's also maybe intimidating because then you're asking a person to to show what they're made of. It's very intimidating in that sense. Yeah. But it's also uh, becoming comfortable with sharing that is really important. Mm. Yeah. I, I asked it out of curiosity. Know thyself. Yeah. One of the most important principles. Mm. Know thyself. So know thy values. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. In a, in a major 
uh, understanding of my values feels as though there's a deep drive towards a a future of more connection to our divine mm -hmm. purpose and nature here on the planet communing more holistically with source and also unleashing all of our gifts and helping each other unleash our gifts mm -hmm. so that's one of the core values and just mm -hmm. to figure out how to do that is a, it's a big challenge in mm -hmm. itself for me like just figuring out how to maximize doing that like right now it's like mm -hmm. oh is it is it having more interviews with leaders? Is it taking a slower down on that to focus on a larger synthesis and distributing multimedia content, mm -hmm. putting it together into really um, uh, like first principled values in like a book format or like what are the, the ways to most effectively achieve this and are the trajectories already determined already are we already going in a, what are your thoughts on that on a free will and determinism i'm all for for the unlimited opportunities that we can create for ourselves so um, i don't have proof for this other than my own experience but um, the other perspective I just don't find appealing enough. Which one? Uh, a perspective of predetermination. Yeah. I just... A boring game. So why, why play this? And it also... Mm, we might be in the kindergarten, as you said, of uh, spirituality, but we can look um, back to thousands of years of humanity and uh, centuries and um, what we see is a development towards a better life. Um, isn't this like a justification for, for the power of self, for the power to create, for the power of humanity to, to create? Yeah. That that's that definitely seems to be a big part of it. Yeah. It just it's like trying to figure out if everything's happening for the purpose of you know, maximizing meaning and consciousness and experience and creativity and technologies helping us with that process. Um, and it's on its exact perfect path that it's on, or if we diverted away from mm -hmm. a holistic stewardship oriented uh, divine alignment with source and we're just mm. thinking that technology is great and that it's enabling mm. more stuff to happen but the tree is growing like this crooked instead of the tree growing yeah. straight I agree with you I just believe this is part of the process to find out how to do it because there is nobody knows so how to, and going into this direction, going from a social system to a social system, from an economic system to a next, to a next, from um, a way of um, living, co-living with other nations on one planet, this way or that way, this is just a learning process that needs to take place for us to learn or to approach this um, divine, how, how do you call it? Like the, the, the ultimate state of, um, of consciousness or, mm -hmm. yeah. I, th there, is, um, there is no answer on how to do this now and the only way to change something is to, to, to act. So we cannot change the world um, by, by discussions. But we have to try different things on. So I agree with you, and maybe we are on the path, maybe we're not. I believe it doesn't matter because both will teach us what to do next. 
Okay. What does those three things um, that we were talking about earlier, what is kind of their, um, let's, let's list them quick. It was purpose, uh, entrepreneurship, and was it innovation? Was technology. It technology, <laughs> yeah. Purpose, entrepreneurship, and technology. Yeah. Where do those three things uh, come? So I write my values down. I go through this process of getting to know myself mm -hmm. better and what I want to do in the world. Mm -hmm. And then how do I like leverage entrepreneurship and technology to bring forth my, mm -hmm. my values? Great question. Whew. So um, the thing about technology becoming exponential, so we have the indus uh, industrial revolution going on. It's the revolution that creates exponential productivity. In the first industrial revolution, we had um, um, created mechanical productivity. So we stopped producing with our hands and left the work to machines. Uh, in the second industrial revolution, uh, we um, gained um, um, automatic productivity. So we, we um, or maybe, no, um, let's say, uh, how, to, uh, how to put it, um, um, it, with the invention of the electricity, we stopped empowering the machines and um, gained uh, the, 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 the mass productivity of having a machine being powered by electricity. Then software came and we gained automatic productivity. And now we are about to gain with artificial intelligence and exponential technologies, exponential productivity. And there is a very simple Chinese story that in my opinion um, illustrates exponential productivity very good. It's the story about a Chinese man that um, invented the game of chess for his king. Do you know the story? No. What so is it? The king really loved it and he said, oh, uh, great, I want to grant you one wish in return as a sign of thanks. Um, what would you want? And uh, the old man was supposedly very wise. He said, I only want some grain wheat grain, but I want it in a specific order. I want one piece of grain to be put on the first square of the chessboard, two on the second, four on the third, eight on the fourth, and this makes the exponential function, and on 64 squares on a square board, just on 64 squares, it makes 70.5 quintillion wheat grains, yeah. which is more than all the sand corns on all the beaches on our planet right now, which is more than the largest wheat manufacturer China can produce in 6,000 years. Mm -hmm. So this is like really fast, really much. And this is what we are gaining now. And I love that your show is called The Simulation because there is a running gag among techies that in the future it will be the probability that you are part of a simulation will be higher than that you're part of a reality because there will be still one reality but exponential number of simulations creating themselves all the time. Mm -hmm. So um, to come back to the question, having this productivity of technology, this really unleashed efficiency and power Technology startups, technology entrepreneurship has become a massive, the most impactful, the most powerful way to change. Um, tech companies have a higher impact on society, on the economy, on, on the well-being, on the people, even on a personal level than any um, public program has ever had. Um, and then being aligned with your purpose and with your values, I as an entrepreneur happen to believe that the best way to pursue a goal is therefore through a technology, uh, to a tech startup. And then what would I do with my values and wanting to bring them forth with technology and entrepreneurship? Like what would be some of my 
like first principled movements towards unleashing my values. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here it gets really interesting because um, uh, most entrepreneurs um, want to have an impact and want to create change. And they start, the majority of us start by truly, purely by good intentions. We all want to save the world and everybody wants to have their share and contribute. But if you're not clear about the values, you will soon face resistance because what is impact? Impact is you push and then the third law of mechanics is you get pushed back. So if you're really about to have an impact, you're going to face resistance. And the story of resistance almost always goes like this. First you are a good person, then you want to have an impact, then you start having impact and then you face resistance and you're threaten to lose something that you like. Um, and if you're not conscious about why you're doing the things that you do and what is like, the, how is that contributing to a larger world, you will not do a lot of wrong if you say, oh no, I just changed my direction. And this, this little inflection point, when you are taking the right or the wrong decision con con consciously, is not something really big, it's not a strategy that you create with a big team and you paint on the wall, it's something that you do all day long every day with every conversation that we have, with every littlest decision that you have. And um, to unleash um, your potential through a tech startup, I believe it's very important today uh, when with technology you can have a massive and rapid impact on the other um, end of the planet within days um, about what you really want to achieve and really focus on that as on a lighthouse because otherwise what we what we've seen a lot um, in the past um, 15 years since I have uh, been in this field and also um, since tech startups have been around because they have always been uh, they have only been around since the internet, so in the past 30 years and then a few emerged, so it's not, um, it has, this tech entrepreneurship thing has only been around for 20, 30 years and the dogma and uh, frameworks have only emerged in the past 15. So it's a very, very fresh thing too. So um, if you want to um, really be impactful, you should be able to resist resistance mm. and you do it with courage and courage comes from your values and from knowing what you're doing it for from the purpose um, and it's something about day-to-day -day decisions little 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 steps what we've seen is to finish my thought a lot of startups start with a purpose to solve some problem and then they run out of money and then they say okay we need to fundraise and then the investors come and suddenly Solving the customer's problem is something, um, yeah, on the side, next to the first purpose, returning the investors their money. Mm -hmm. And this totally shifts your focus. So one, one thing is really to, uh, to be mindful about those choices because nobody has said you need an investment or you need a lot of customers or you need a big company or you need whatever. You have the freedom to decide to do just the right things. But it requires the courage to look at the look at an open-end road, rather than I want to be famous within five years to come to Forbes thirty under thirty or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that's really critical advice. So we're initially going to face a lot of resistance when we take our values and we want to push them forth with entrepreneurship and technology even when we do successfully maybe get through the first couple steps there's going to be even more resistance on the next couple steps mm. and you're just going to keep facing resistance yeah. as you keep going and so to persevere through that with great amounts of courage is important also to be patient so that it's not about some sort of like a, mm -hmm. i want to get super high super fast but that it's more about just, I want to provide value to other people at whatever pace I am aligned with the divine purpose to bring. Yeah. And then there is no failure. Because mm. if you are on purpose, if you're driven by the desire to create a better world, 
you created with every single one of those efforts, with every single one of those little inflection points overcoming resistance. You create a better world by every conversation that we have, by every check that you pay or get, it is failure by definition disappears. And a lot of the talk about failure is because we um, define um, a very narrow, very egocentric goal. Like, I want to have those things by this moment. And of course, this is something that can fail. But the purpose can never fail. And I actually start my book with, um, with the mission of the Chinese aerospace team that uh, mm -hmm. reached the dark side of the moon at the beginning of this year. Mm -hmm. And it's a really, really important um, um, de def definition underlining uh, thing. So they had the purpose to reach the dark side of the moon, which was not yet um, reached by humanity because it's on the other side, it's difficult to reach and uh, uh, not um, accessible for our satellites. And the purpose of the mission was to reach this side? No, the purpose of the mission was to reach this side so that we can learn about the dark side of the moon and by this about the entire moon and by this about the entire universe and by this about our, our um, own place in it better. Mm -hmm. So this is the purpose. Their mission was successful, they landed on the dark side of the moon, but even if they hadn't landed, the purpose wouldn't have failed, because the purpose is to learn about yeah. all the stuff. So um, I think what really purpose gives you is the freedom of failure and uh, the freedom for courage, and this is why it is so profound. Ooh, I like that. Okay, <laughs> so you're free from failure and you're f more free to be more courageous and to persevere and to be driven by purpose rather than be driven by any materialism or fame or, yeah. Any, yeah. 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 I, I heard a talk by Simon Sinek. Uh, it's uh, from a new book he's working on. It's called The Infinite Game. And he says, a lot of what we do in society, and business in particular, we play is a finite game. And a finite game is defined by, um, it's predefined. It has a, a beginning and an ending, and you know all the rules and all the players from the beginning. But the world is not like this. You almost never know the rules. Uh, you almost never know the players. And there is actually no ending. So if you play the infinite game, focus on purpose and on what I really want to contribute, you're just laying the stones. And maybe you will not be the one that reaches to the end of the road, but you're laying the stones for others to come and um, uh, eventually reach this point. And this is yeah. why no, uh, no large social revolution has been driven by one person. Um, most of them have been um, a series of um, small events, destinies of individuals that were needed in order for this one moment, for this one flagship event, notorious, uh, journalistically represented thing to happen so that the entire system changes. Yeah. That's great. That's a great way to put it. Is that if you follow that your purpose, that it, it's uh, you're laying down the the stepping stones, and that you're you, the goal isn't to finish paving the path. The goal yes. is to just keep laying down stepping mm -hmm. stones for more people to be able to um, bring their gifts forth and yes. build a more better world. Yeah. Just think about the book because I know you're working on something too, mm -hmm. and I have recently published the Big Heart Ventures. And um, I did a little bit of research. Um, being an author, being a writer in Germany is the second most desired profession. And Germany is a country with 88 million citizens. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many full-time registered authors, uh, writers live in uh, Germany? Around 8,000. Wow. So being it the, the second most desired profession, and having that little writers in such a big country, that is also wealthy. So it's not just a matter of can I earn with this or not. It's just 
there is a lot of fear. So people who write books typically very often do not publish them out of the fear. Will it be successful? Will it be recognized? Uh, yeah. So now if you, if you think about the purpose of the book, and um, this is how I wrote my book, um, if you do this, bu if the book is purpose driven, and my purpose was to start this conversation about the influence that technology can have and our responsible role as entrepreneurs in it better, like, yeah, um, then you are achieving this, I am already living the purpose of having this topic be in the conversation without having the need to sell the book or the book to be successful or to, to become a successful writer mm -hmm. because this book is not about me it is about this topic and no matter if it's well written or poorly or whatever it is already creating or co-creating this movement towards purpose sustainability away from shareholders blah, 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 blah. so it's just one of the pieces that are also necessary to to some when reach the critical mass and change the way we we do business yeah. So when we move from a place of selflessness, when we move from a place of purpose, of a divine co-creation, of, of knowing that we may just be putting down some of the, the foundational steps for others to walk down, it just makes it so that our contribution to society feels more whole every step of the way. And it doesn't feel like we're ever lacking some sort of, uh, I'm lacking uh, resources or I'm uh, lacking some sort of like a shareholder return or all these other yeah. types of things. Hmm. But we still need our basic needs met. So that, that kind of makes it also a little bit complicated because we do need like investing so much time into something. Mm. We want to have our basic needs be met yeah. so that we can continue being creative. Yes, but um, I have never said self self. Selfishness. Selfishness? Yeah, selflessness. N yeah. Selflessness. No, um, it is not about. Um, and this is, see, this is the problem right now. We think either you're there for the profit or you have to be selfless. So it's like money or love. I, I don't believe this. Technology has empowered us to be both. Mm -hmm. And I don't think in um, extremes. Um, I believe that. If we want to uh, become better, we need to be looking for ways to, to, to do both. So it's really, it's definitely not this selfless game because this is something that is eating you um, up and um, is actually making the impact less. Hmm. Oh, interesting. There is a lot of evidence for this, for example, how our health, um, health um, system works. So, so job, social jobs that are known to be done by people that are purpose driven, that do them not for the money but because they want to help, typically are worse paid. Typically people in those professions need to retire earlier because they're burnt out. And we know that this has not contributed to a high quality of service in this area. So it has to be, a, there has to be an equilibrium. What I'm saying is that when you're trying to do a business, try not to do it to become famous, which startups are known for, or founders. Try not to do it to become rich, which very few successful companies are known for. Try not to do it to, to be cool, because um, entrepreneurship is not a cool game. It's actually very often a very mundane um, set of activities that need to be done. Uh, and if you're not doing it for any of those reasons, but you're doing to really solve a problem or to really help somebody or to really help the whole humanity make one step in one direction, then you're going to be successful by definition. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love the amount of time that you've passed on figuring out this, yeah, and being able to communicate to other people and inspire them. Thank Thanks, you. Tina, yeah. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I like this a lot. Is, um, 
Mintess is available for people to also download and use, and Big Heart Ventures is available for people to buy and read and share yes. as well. Yes. So Mintess uh, cannot be downloaded. It's a web app, it's but web app. you can try it on our website. The book is available on Amazon or in every um, large uh, bookshop in Germany. Um, there is nothing else I sell. <laughs> maybe maybe the Big Heart Collective. So if you if uh, people want to join and meet other purpose-driven um, entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs. Uh, the, the community is available under bigheartcollective.com mm -hmm. and um, there is not much more. I have a couple other questions that we ask our guests that I want to ask you. Okay. What is your relationship with God or source or the divine or creation? What's your mm. relationship with that? Mm. Um, I told you my opinion about words being labels mm -hmm. for stuff. So I, I am I'm always very cautious when people misuse a label not with its purpose to make a shortcut to something on the inside but um, dogmatically. So for me all of that is like the same. Yeah. There is um, there is the, the the conscious connection to yourself or its um, lack and there is the power to believe in something better or there is not so this is how I see those all those um, labels words do you know what I mean so your relationship with those words is that the words take away from the your connection to it or what is your, your what yes is this is a good point i haven't thought about this yet but yes i i feel the words are um superfluous is this the right yeah, word yeah. yeah yeah so it's um i think one one of the reasons for for religion to be where it is is that it started relying a lot uh, way too much on words and maybe way too little on the purpose of those things so be it um, the one the one religion or the other or just the believe in yourself um, those are all words that are different for every person And our own unique ways of communing with that higher power is mm. so important. And I just feel like it's there's a great amount of lacking in our world of like, I just do feel like humans have forgotten that higher power mm. in many ways mm. and that maybe technology can help us remember that yeah. higher power. It does definitely mm. feel sometimes like. Yeah. Like really fast computers or like really fast internet. That's feel true, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> like on the one hand side, we have of. automated ourselves a lot. But on the other, we have gained a lot of free time and people are starting to meditate again. And uh, we have evidence from really um, spiritual um, societies from thousands of years before. So I don't necessarily believe it's a downward trend maybe it's like a cyclic development mm. and mm. i do believe that all of what is happening is and needs to be so that the next the future comes what would you say about the the spirit or the soul meeting the body for this adventure of consciousness or do you feel like consciousness mm. emerges from the Mm. biological process. yeah absolutely and there is um so again consciousness emerges biologically all words labels but um i do believe that um each and every one of us has felt it sometimes somebody says a word and suddenly uh, we feel it somehow and for a long time this has been an esoteric subject but um with technology again, with computer tomographs and so on, um, 
a lot of advances in um, neuroscience have been made showing the connection between the mind and the body and depending on in what regard you consider spirituality being part of the mind or a mind characteristic it has been proven so to say that what people assumed thousands of years uh, so far is true do you feel like we come from somewhere beyond this body mm. into the body for experiencing yeah. consciousness Mm, I haven't I haven't thought about it. I haven't maybe I'm not on my journey there yet to think about those subjects, but I am very much a fan of being here and now. Mm -hmm. You know? So I love thinking about stuff and every person who wants to write a book needs to be a little bit of, you know, philosopher to to write spinning thoughts and to like spinning thoughts. But I'm more concerned about really this consciousness of now. What is now available? What is now possible? What is the next step? And the only thing that really um, next to this matters for me is the great purpose that I want to spare my time for. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like our disconnection from nature from source, do you feel like that's the reason why we have so many of the problems in our world? Mm. I don't know. Actually, sitting here and uh, looking uh, out of your window, I feel yeah. you're very connected to nature. <laughs> so critical. California is a beautiful place where it feels like, at least from the outside, it feels very much, um, it seems, very much like people are living very close to nature also in Bulgaria so mm. um, I don't know yeah when you're not in like the downtown LA or downtown San Francisco or Oakland yeah. San Jose, et cetera, when you're more like near the woods or near the ocean yeah. or whatnot you're definitely um, mm. more holistically connected yeah. here and I'm sure in Bulgaria and other places mm -hmm. in the world as well that when you, you or if you're in the metropolis, the downtown city center, it feels like the matrix. Mm. But when you're outside near the woods and whatnot, it feels less so. Yeah. Like that. Would you say that we're in a simulation? <laughs> uh, good one. Hmm. Why would you want to know? What difference would it ma make? Understanding our source code is very important. So if we understand our source code, then maybe we understand the ultimate nature of this reality. Mm -hmm. And that makes it easier for us to potentially solve some of the big problems and big challenges, mm -hmm. that type of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And um, on the other hand side, if you if you describe a if you explain a three-year-old um, how um, how a car is built or a solar panel, he would still n or she would still not be able to build it because they would lack, for example, the physical strength to bring up the tools, and you yeah. know. So it's it's always. Um, the right time, with the right resources, with the right purpose that need to come together for something to emerge. Mm. Yeah, yeah. What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Oh. Um, children's eyes. Yeah. Just um, the ingenuity and the curiosity and um, and um, un, un, 
how do you say, uncoloredness of emotion, the ability to to witness something without a judgment, um, absorbed by the desire just to witness it, not even consciously to learn, because we grown-ups are like, okay, let me witness it so I improve, so I get mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just to witness. Yes, yeah. I just um, think there is nothing more beautiful than this. I love it. This has been such a fun conversation, <laughs> Tina. Thank for you. me too. Thank Good. you for inviting me. I'm so happy you came on. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on the show. Thanks a lot. And good luck with yeah. your book and with your um, project. Thank you. Thank you. And likewise, same thing with you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on, your, on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. <laughs> Also, do have more conversations with your friends, your families, coworkers, people online about purpose, about your values, mm -hmm. about how to unleash those values into the world, leveraging technology, leveraging entrepreneurship to bring those forth. Also, check out the links in the bio below to mentessa.com, also tinaruseva.com, bigheartbook.com. Check out our social profiles as well. Check those out, everyone. Support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support Simulation. Our links are below to our Patreon, cryptocurrency, PayPal links. Find all those below. You can design cool merch and get paid. Also, go and build the future, everyone. <laughs> Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.